in 2008, an old friend of mine, Wes, told me they were giving away a free copy of Fable 2, which you could download and play on the Xbox 360. I started playing it and just absolutely loved it, though I only got to Bowerstone before the game wanted me to pay for the full version. Yeah, it turns out it was only a free trial. However, Wes played it to death and he said he could lend me the game, but I wasn't going to see him for a few days. But I really wanted to play this game. What was I to do? Go outside? <laughs> uh... So I dug out my old Xbox games and found Fable 1. Now hear me out, back then I always found this game so hard to play. <laughs> I was about 9 or 10, and I think at the time I was just a bit too young to understand and play RPG games, as most of my games back then were Halo, Grand Theft Auto, Assassin's Creed, you know, parenting wasn't an issue. I actually got Fable 1 years prior to that, so I was probably about 7 or 8 as a gift, and you can imagine how much harder it was even then. The bit when you're trying to sneak into Twin Blades camp, yeah. Couldn't do it. Intruder, shut the gate! Fuck you and your mother. Really. Fuck you and- But I said to myself, this is the closest to Fable 2 I'm gonna get. So in the meantime, while I'm waiting for the game to be lended to me, I might as well give this one a shot. I did actually end up completing it before I uh, met up with my friend when he lent me Fable 2. And I actually really enjoyed it. And I still didn't really play it as an RPG. I didn't understand it, how it worked in terms of loading up the character, what build you want to make, which is no wonder why I found it so challenging. To cut a long story short, a few years later, I bought Fable Anniversary, which came out in 2014 on the Xbox 360, and I got it 100% and all the achievements, bar one, and I can't get this one anymore because Smart Glass is closed down, so I'm slowly dying inside. Being how this was technically my first ever RPG experience, RPG meaning role playing games for those who don't know, not. Revisiting it and playing it how you're supposed to, it was great, and I remember enjoying it even more, and I had a better understanding on it, which is why I thought I would do a review on it, and see whether or not you agree with my views, or if you're interested in buying the game, but you want to know more about it. I'll be talking a lot about this game throughout this review, as you can imagine, but also be mentioning the story, so spoiler warning. With all that said, let's dive straight into it. Fable was developed by a company called Lionhead Studios, to which was founded by Peter Molyneux in 1996. A brilliant, creative, trusting, visionary of a man who was brutally honest all of the time. I'm just kidding. He's an unusual man who lies to his fans and has driven the hype train of misleading information for years. You know, there were, there were some things that really um, aggravated me that we couldn't do, we couldn't make it more Fable 1 more open world, partly because the system just didn't have enough money. Right. We had this ridiculous thing where I had said in the press about you should be able to plant an oak. I was going to ask, I, was, I, yeah. I had to ask you about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the ridiculous, this is the way I worked, you know, at one point in the game, the game did have acorns that you could plant that would grow into trees. Yeah. but. You know, this is the Xbox One we're talking about. The, here. Meaning, it, the original Xbox. Yeah, the original Xbox, the, not the Xbox One. It's the <laughs> Xbox, you know, initial. I don't under, I didn't understand a one word you said. However, with all that said, without him starting this company, we would not have the Fable universe, as all of those wonderful people that worked around the clock to create this wonderful universe would have not been able to do that without the backing of their creative lead, Molyneux. In Fable 1's development, Peter made a numerous amount of remarks stating the game would have the following. The player could have the ability to become a parent. Definitely in this game, you can shut up women, you can even get married, and you can have children. I won't go into the details of how you do that. <laughs> it's false. Another promise, if you can see something in the horizon, you'll be able to go there. How large will the environment be in the game? How much land will you have to traverse? And will you guys be adding things like horses so that you can, you can adding things like horses, adding things like horses, cross terrain quicker? Yeah, the, the world is truly massive. You play on different lands, you've actually had need to take, you know, actually need to take passages across to different lands. But let's, let's talk about moving around. In role-playing games, I found it just ultimately boring yes. to walk up and down that same old path. Yeah. So one of the early skills that you can achieve in the willpower is to teleport yourself. And what, what did he say? Oh, oh. To teleport yourself. To teleport yourself. To teleport yourself. <laughs> One of the early 
the skills that you can achieve and the willpower is to teleport yourself. And what the rule that we've imposed is anywhere you can see you can go to. You just reach your hand up there and you can go in that thing. It's totally made up. The other thing I should say is we can't really demonstrate it here. Fable can be played up to four player, multiplayer, cooperatively. Pure fiction. And this is not to say Fable is a bad game, because it's not. Far from it. It's one of the few games I will honestly go back and just fall in love with again without being bored too quickly and playing another game. Yes, nostalgia has a lot to do with that, but one thing's for sure, the team at Lionhead Studios knew what they were trying to do and created a beautiful, unique game and kept that element I feel throughout the entire series. Even with Molyneux steering them in a disorganised direction, with all of these random ideas he would come up with but never implement into the game. I think the most important part for me about Fable is that it would have been just as successful as it is now without those false promises made by Molyneux. It didn't need to happen, and yet it did, because Molyneux couldn't resist driving the old hype train. escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. You start out as a young boy, woken by your father, who tells you to go out and help the townsfolk of Oakvale. If you perform good deeds, he will reward you with a gold piece. You gotta accumulate three in total to buy your sister, Teresa, a birthday present. You can also have the option to be a total dick and beat up children. Instead, I decide to go the good route and be a good little two-shoes. You have? Right. Hello lad, say happy birthday to your sister for me, won't you? Yo, filthy swap! Now according to Molyneux... I've learned from my mistakes. What I'm going to be doing is I'm trying to make Fable 2 the greatest role-playing game of all time again. If this was true, why does the main foundation of this game, which is literally displayed on the front cover, have a fatal flaw right at the start? You literally have two choices, right? Good or evil, right from the get-go. And yet if you lie to the concerned wife about her husband who is having an affair, he gives you a gold piece instead of your father. Okay. I'm willing to accept that that makes sense to me. Okay, so when I smash this guy's entire stock up as he goes for his shit, he comes back and thanks me. Excellent thanks, lad. You've done me a big favor. What are you, fucking stupid? You can then beat up this little kid, but ultimately, in order to progress through the game, you have to beat up the bully, regardless. So you still perform a good deed, twice, without intentionally wanting to. After all of that, your father still gives you the goal to buy a present anyway. So what's the point of having the good and evil choices at the moment? It's very clear right from the start of the game, the developers want you to go down the good path almost immediately. Anyway, I go and buy my sister a present and go and meet her big ass head at the top of the village, where she tells me of a nightmare she had about the village being attacked by bandits. And then it actually happens. Bandits! She tells me to go and hide, so I do my best and jump over this wide gap, three foot picket fence and manage to stay out of sight with my 1200 meter diameter head while the bandits terrorize the village. Got one! If you've had an accident recently that wasn't your fault, find out free if you can make a no win, no fee claim. Call the National Accident Helpline now on 0800 556 557. You then find out whilst you were hiding, your sister went home and supposedly was killed in the attack, along with your father and mother, which creates the feeling of isolation, thanks to the tone and the cutscene, and especially the narration. From the nearby woods, the boy watched as all he knew was taken away. His whole life was crushed to ashes. He was alone.
Whilst going through the burnt village, you find your father's body, and a bandit spots you, and just as he's about to kill you, he gets killed by Maze, a powerful will user. I know he's voiced by a guy called Peter Dixon, but my god, every time I hear this guy speak, all I hear is Bill Nye. My name is Maze, and I'm the head of the Guild of Heroes. You must have heard of it. Come on, let's get pissed and watch porn. So Bill Nye... Maze takes you to the Heroes Guild, where you meet the Guildmaster and this bitch. My name's Whisper. I've been here for a month. Had the room to myself till now, too. But that's alright. Why don't you go outside and play hide and go fuck yourself? As you progress through your training from childhood to teen, you learn about the three main combat styles in the game. Cause tonight will be the night that I will fall for you! Over again. After you learn the basics of combat in the game, you can either do a small amount of side questing around the guild, like help Whisper in the Woods. We can now move on to your final test if you're ready. Or you can spend some more time exploring the guild. I believe Whisper is about to go into the guild woods, if you wish to join her. The boy mastered the skills quickly. After graduating, the guild master then explains to me how the progression system works. I gotta say, even though I'm playing it back, now feels very simple and basic in comparison to other games that you get nowadays. There is a sense of, what can I do? What build do I go for? Or which skill should I grind first? However, there is one issue with the progression system in this game. Now, this particular issue, some people may not actually think it is an issue and even if you asked me a few years ago if it was i'd probably say no it's no issue at all but i'll talk about it further on into the video and explain my point because it will come up but let's talk about how the progression system works so every enemy that you kill will provide you with combat specific xp and also general xp depending on how you killed them for example the blue orbs represent xp for will so you use magic to kill your enemies. Red orbs represent XP for strength, so you kill them with a melee attack. And lastly, the yellow orbs represent XP for skill, so using your bow and arrow. But the green orbs are the general XP, which can then be used universally. So if you're low on, let's say, some skill XP, general XP can also be used to obtain that skill. So what is there to do in Fable, besides the story? Well, quite a lot actually. And I've got to say, coming back to this game even just for recording the footage and to refresh my memory a little, straight away I felt like I could grind this game for hours. A game that can bring you the sense of fun and entertainment for the fourth or even fifth time around has that replayability. Usually for me, with most games, I need some sense of reason why I should play this instead of something else especially if I've already played it before. It needs to have some form of progression. And for me, it's usually completing a game 100% and getting all of the achievements. So games that I already have completed, I tend not to revisit with the exception of a few. And Fable is one of those games, which tells you a lot about a game really. If you are looking to lose yourself and go off from the story for a while, this is the game for you. Like any RPG, you can go to the nearest town, drink or gamble your hard earned cash away. England. Come on England. Can you tell us something your mum doesn't know? Yeah. Oh. You can upgrade your gear, help the people around the town out, from helping a sick child by finding mountain mushrooms, or help the local school and find books across Albion, or even get a new look for a blind date. Thing is, she only likes men whose hair looks like the picture on this card. A few moments later. Hello again. That's just about the perfect haircut. My daughter will be very happy. But I forgot, she also prefers men with beards that look a lot like the one on this card. Few minutes later. You're really starting to look the part now. No moustache though. Didn't I mention she loves the one on this card? Twelve seconds later. Nice selection of face fungus you have there. But to be honest, I don't give two hoots what you look like. And neither does my daughter. She doesn't even exist. I just like making heroes like you look stupid. Have you seen... Maximum The cynical side of me wants to say, wow, this game just dealt me three fetch quests straight away. Maybe next time I should wear knee pads if I want to get fucked up. If you want, you can also have the option to buy a house. The game is so realistic because I still can't afford a house even in Fable. 
Silver keys can be found across the whole of Albion, to which opens locked chests with valuable loot inside. The more silver keys you have, the more chests you can open for more valuable loot. Speaking of valuable loot, you can also find demon doors, which are also located across Albion. They only open by a hero performing certain actions. For example, the demon door at the Heroes Guild requires you to have the most light you can in the game, which can be acquired by performing good deeds. Until you reach max light status, the demon door will remain closed. Each demon door you open will have a unique setting and a unique piece of loot. Having both silver keys to collect and demon doors to unlock, among other activities you can find yourself doing in the game, Fable wouldn't be Fable without these weird and wonderful doors and silver chests. You will have a lot to do to keep yourself occupied. There's also a fishing mini game that allows you to find special items needed to progress the game, as well as treasure underground for you to dig. Speaking of treasure, there is also treasure clues you can find in the game to help you locate the main treasure the game has in store for you. Spoiler alert, it's just a frying pan. But it does cook up some mean eggs. Quests can be found at the guild. Every time a new quest is available, the guild master will let the player know, which is why most of what he says is a meme. You don't look much like hero material to me, but Maze knows what he's doing, I suppose. Here you will find some of the game's side quests, as well as the main storyline. Most side quests will have two ways to complete. You can either oppose or support whoever has placed this quest card at the guild. For example, I can either attack Orchard Farm with the bandits or protect it with the guards. Whatever option you decide, you can either accept or accept and boast. The game will provide a number of boasts for the player to choose from. Whichever the player chooses, if they complete said boast, the player will get extra cash as a reward. I never fancied doing boasts in my previous playthroughs, but for the sake of the video, I decided to do it this time round. And I'm glad I did, as I wagered no god will die in the attack, and I managed to keep them all alive, and got a big payout. Must be worth plenty Ooh. of money to someone though. I'll make sure to tell everyone about you. We need heroes like you around. After killing the Wasp Queen and kicking the shit out of Whisper again, Maze tells me there is more to this world than Wasp Queens. He then tells you there may be another survivor from your family, who was supposedly killed when you were a child, Teresa, and that I should upgrade my basic equipment, even though I just got it, but since we're already in Bowstone, I might as well, and I can see why the game wants you to do it at this point. Turns out I can't actually afford it, I spent all my money on my new title I got earlier. He's one of them rangers, the dangerous folk they are, one of them. What his right name is, I've never heard. After beating Whisper for a third time in a kill count, I've had enough of this. Maybe the guild has something more interesting for me. Maybe fuck yourself. I escort some traders through Darkwood into Barra Fields, and right next to Barra Fields is Oakvale, where Maze wants to meet me to discuss a new appearance of my missing family member. Once I arrived in Oakvale, a random NPC comes up to me and apparently manages to recognize me from when I was a child whilst I'm currently wearing a chainmail helmet. Then my character tries to mind fuck her. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but he does end up getting PTSD. Hang on a minute, this, this doesn't make sense. I thought I was the only survivor from the attack. They're all dead. You don't want to join them, do you? Well, anyway, I go and meet Maze. I thought maybe you were getting too famous to be seen round here. Oh, oh honey, girl, okay. security. He tells me there is no news as of yet regarding my missing sister. However, coincidentally, there is a blind woman working with a group of bandits nearby who follow a guy called Twinblade, who used to be a hero of the guild. This blind Cirrus, 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 this person may know the whereabouts of my quote unquote lost sister. Since the stealth mechanics in this game literally consists of pressing the left stick down and having my guy slightly hunch over to avoid being seen, I decided not to do that. So instead of that shit, I thought I'd try something else and kill all the bandits guarding the gate before any of them realize and just waltz on through. Once inside, I overhear a guard giving a lot of exposition to make it very clear on how the player will need to look like a bandit in order to enter the camp. After attaining a bandit outfit by looting convenient chests nearby with every piece of clothing required, I am allowed through the first area of the camp in order to proceed to the next area I need to get a pass. This guy can sell me one for a thousand gold. Hey pal, you just blowing from stupid town? Another guy bets me if I beat him in his memory game, he will give me a pass. So I managed to beat him and head on through to confront Twinblade. You sure about that? You sure about that? You sure about that? I've been waiting for you. I was very much looking forward to this boss fight, as I knew my character was pretty OP at this point in the game, due to me spending more time leveling him up, exploring the world, 
etc. Funny I should be thinking that because the game developers also knew most players would be quite OP at this point in the game. That's why they gave us the meanest, baddest looking villain we have seen so far in this game. She said a guild puppet would come, and here you are. I'm over here! Now how this boss fight works is Twinblade is invulnerable. So all that hard work you put in your skills is now obsolete until he does a big stab on the ground. No one knows why he does this. It's not the most tactical of uh, fight skills, but it is what he does. And because he does this, his twin swords get stuck in the ground, which now gives the player the opportunity to hit him in the back, which takes some of his health away. But this now makes the battle longer than it needs to be, as well as very repetitive, as now the only way to deal damage is to hit him from behind. Back when I was a kid, I didn't have a clue on how RPGs worked, how to play them correctly. I was dreading this fight when I saw Twinblade, as you can imagine, it was terrifying. But then after the cutscene, and when I could see how you have to fight him, I was so relieved. It was incredibly easy. You know, that was when I was a kid, but now revisiting it, I find it boring, repetitive, and lazy. I mean, it may have been cool back in 2004 seeing an animation of a massive dude just getting your sword stuck in the ground, but upon reflection, it is simply uninspiring design flaw with this character's weakness and fighting style. Anyway, once he's back, can't take it anymore from behind. Ha! <laughs> Gay! The blind seerist appears, who is revealed to be your sister, Teresa. She watched in silence as the bandits tortured her mother, then turned to her with questions of the missing boy. What the hell are you talking about? He answered them only with a stare, and so their leader sliced out her eyes. What? 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 She then tells you she sees your future and states that she can see you in an arena in a ring of blood and sand. Are you not entertained? She also reveals the choice the player will have to make at the end of the game that is vital. Not sure if this is foreshadowing or downright spoiling the fucking game, but we move on. Instead of killing Twinblade, I kill all the bandits around him for that delicious succulent XP. Yeah, boy. After returning to the guild, Maze asks me to find someone called the Archaeologist in Witchwood. After almost smelling shit, I unlock the demon door where the Archaeologist is hiding, and he isn't best pleased that I found him, as if I can find him, so can they. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll be off. It's not safe for me here anymore, thanks to you. Daddy, chill. What the hell is even that? Back at the guild, I accept a quest card to help defend a town called Knothole Glade from Balverines and accepted a boast to not take any damage. <sighs> After clearing out the remaining Balverines, the town's guard opens the gates and lets us in, where I go and speak to the chief of Knothole Glade. He mentions the attack could have been managed were it not for the White Balverine which just so happens to start attacking the town. After repeatedly hitting the White Balverine, nothing seems to work. And then you learn from a widow that the only way to kill the White Balverine is with silver. Turns out her late husband killed the last White Balverine using this silver augmentation, but it got bit during the fight and has now become the new one. Please take this, end his pain. Once he's dead, I am rewarded by the chief and now nominated to fight in the arena in Witchwood. Before heading to the arena to begin the quest, I look at some of the boasts available to me. One of them being, show no mercy, kill all you face. Interesting. I've never seen this particular boast in any previous quest I've done. Now, why would it show me this boast at this particular time at this quest? Hmm. Careless whisper. The arena is a fan favourite, or at least the game dev's favourite, as it's featured in all Fable games, and in my honest opinion, they all offer something different, with Fable 1 being the most unique out of all three games. There are 8 rounds in total, each round offers different enemy types. Round 1 are wasps, the second round are hobs, and then the third round are balverines to which Whisper joins and quote unquote helps fight by your side. The fourth round is the undead which are my personal favourite to fight. The fifth round are bandits, which are a classic. The sixth round are earth trolls. They're not as strong as rock trolls, but still can be quite tough, especially with the company of Whisper on your team. The seventh round are rock trolls. If I had more of a useful teammate, I would have completed this round in half the time. But my god, Whisper can't even deal much damage towards her enemies. All right, fine, just sit there and be a tank. Take all of the hits while I focus on damage. 
Nope, she can't even stay on her own two fucking feet. All right, fine, just keep their eyes on you, be the distraction while I do all the work. Nope, she is too busy doing all these fucking somersaults and dancing like a clown while I get dicked on by fucking Stonehenge. Look into my eyes, you will see. Once those two are defeated, we then fight Arakonox for the final round. Or so I thought. Once you kill Arakonox, which I found to be quite an easy fight, but I still somewhat enjoyed it. Plus, I like the design of him, which kind of reminds me you don't get these unique boss fights as much in the sequels, which I do miss. Even if they look a little goofy and are quite easy to kill, they're still worth having in the game at least. So the actual last round, a mysterious red-hooded masked man called Jack of Blades announces this last round is a fight to the death. Gotta say, I kind of prefer the old voice actor to this one. Let me know down in the comments what you guys think. I have returned. After an eternity away from you all, Jack of Blades is back. I have returned. After an eternity away from you all, Jack of Blades is back. Whisper tells me she wants to put on a good show, but refuses to kill me. Once I defeat her as it was inevitable, I am left with the choice to kill her or let her live. Of course, I'm not going to kill her as I'm playing the good character. Hey! We have a new arena champion! After making a shit ton of money thanks to the bonus of killing Whisper, I go meet Lady Grey, who invites me to go see her in Battlestone North, which you now have access to thanks to the champion's seal. Then me and Thunder have a nice heart to heart. You murdered my sister. As I'm being escorted out of the arena through the Hall of Heroes by a guard, he gives me some Albion history references and points to a particular statue of Scarlet Row. As he states, I reminded him of her. Turns out, <gasps> she is my missing mother. And due to the detail of the statue, my character is able to decipher that is my mother. Jack of Blades has sunk some points into Guile and creeps up behind me to tell me all the information he has about my missing mother and then tells me he can't wait to reunite us both, including my sister. So he obviously knows where she is and is most likely responsible for her disappearance. And what does my character do with this information? Not not so you get a story time on who Scarlet Robe was. She was a slayer of Balverines and one day was slowly dying from her injuries until a woodsman called Brom found her in the woods nearby and nursed her back to health. From there they got married and had two children, a girl and a boy. I do like that story that your mum has this badass hero kind of history to her to which you can then create again in the sequels which I thought was quite clever. So for example if you play as a female character on Fable 2 in your Fable 3 playthrough Everyone will talk about your badass queen hero mother, which can give you the same effect you experience all the way back in Fable 1. But I admit, Lionhead, I am impressed. Certain quests will require the player to become more renowned first before starting. Basically, this is the game's way to get the player to come away from the main story and explore more of the game and see what Fable has to offer. So in between the story missions, I found myself leveling up my character, as well as upgrading my gear and weapons and completing side quests. First up, we have the Chapel of Scorn, a place where you bring people of Albion to be sacrificed and you'll be rewarded, as well as receive evil points to your morality. As I'm, you know, doing the good playthrough, I will not be sacrificing anyone. Afterwards, I found the bordello. The fuck is that? This guy won't give up the deeds and supposedly is running the place into the ground and treating all of the staff unfairly. Apparently, after giving this guy only six pints, he needs to hit the hay. Ooh, 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 ooh. Whilst looking like a fucking borrower in his huge bed, he then tells me in his sleep where the deeds are, so I go and find them and return them to madam. Well, I hope it rots and drops off. Oh, that's real nice. Once he fucks off, I change the bordello into a refuge, which gives me good boy points. Oh, oh my, oh. After completing that quest, I now have enough renown points to help Rose, an old lady who is currently looking for her missing grandson. She gives you a hexagon key, which doesn't actually do anything and is apparently pointless. It was meant to be used as access to the Hob Cave. Turns out it actually isn't required at all, so it was clearly put in the game and uh, forgotten about. What I'm trying to do is 
create the greatest role-playing game of all time. Anyway, I return Rose's grandson, then he leaves immediately. Why are you running away? James, I'm speaking to you. Nice to see you. Now I have enough money to buy a house and rent it out, and unlike most landlords in the UK, I keep the rent fair and realistic. It's a good way of making money and also making some social impact as well by providing homes for people who need them. <coughs> is, is, that, is that what got you into it? I uh, must admit it was a financial element that got me into it. Whilst now getting a passive income, I can spend more time doing quests instead of buying and selling crates at general shops for my income. Wow. I'm pleased to serve you. This deal's getting worse all the time. Oh, like cool nice <laughs> ready to help. <laughs> After not having enough mushrooms for the witch, I get a reminder of what I was actually like in Amsterdam. Not enough mushrooms. Bring me more. So as I'm on hold on that mission, I decide to help this guy open up his chicken kicking game. But the area where he wants to open it is being haunted by a sailor ghost, i.e. Pirate. I go and meet his widow as requested to give her his buried loot, which I managed to find earlier, all by myself. Once that's done, he then leaves, then I get a chance to kick some chicken. The silver medal position, a center left scores you 50. What? What the fuck? Let's talk about the range combat in this game, as there's always been something about range that's always annoyed me. The combat itself is great. Feels satisfying shooting an enemy from a distance and seeing all of your XP points displayed per hit, as well as the sound design backing it. So far so good you know, I mean it could be argued it's a little clunky, like the melee combat, but for it's worth, especially when it originally came out, I like the ranged combat in this game. What I do not like however, is this one little detail they forgot to get rid of, and not just only in the original version, but the re-release 10 years later. Once I point this out to you, it's going to bug you too, if it hasn't done so already. Now, it doesn't matter how far you get in this game, or how much you spend grinding your level, upgrading your gear and character, something stays with you right from the start and right at the end. I'm going to give you a little time to have a think about it and ponder what it is. No? Still can't think of it? Allow me to show you. Oh, how, how dumb is that? It's, it's even more stupid the fact that they'd even bring it in in the 2014 release, the fucking remaster version of this game. I don't understand how they cannot just add that little feature and they looked and go, oh, that's going to look really stupid by the time they upgrade their character and get to a certain point in the game. Let's do something about that. I mean, all they needed to do was just match the quiver to the design of the Baron Abbott, whatever the player would purchase. I mean, fucking Skyrim does it and it's fucking Skyrim. Think about it, right? You're at the end of the game. You're either the hero or the villain of Albion, but you will always be remembered by the townsfolk as the man who was obsessed with keeping his farm boy quiver. <laughs> Unless you use a crossbow, the quiver will stay with you for life. So if you're going for a mage build, I would recommend equipping the crossbow or just unequipping it entirely. After defeating Twinblade in the story, the game provides a side quest for you to return to this camp and rescue some traders from the bandits' captivity. I just got out of guard college last week and I only got a C- in hostage recovery. Loser! You're a loser! Are you feeling sorry for yourself? Well, you should be, because you are dirt! You make me sick, you big baby! I decided to visit the Temple of Avo in Witchwood. The more you donate, the more rewards your character gets, one of them being health regeneration, if I continue to donate a thousand gold three times. Your reward will be slight. You want to sue the church? After failing to lift a sword from the stone, I went to the gym to try and get fucking swole. And it worked. All jokes aside, the game does set you up to fail because the moment you try and lift the sword, regardless of what level your health, toughness or physique is, the game will now remember what your stats were when you tried to lift it, and now will want you to get 5 more levels into physique, 2 in health, and 3 levels in toughness. So for most players, at this point in the game, for example me, I had to max out all of my strength skill points. While I was in Knothole Glade, I thought I'd purchase and rent out another property because... It's free real estate. So let's talk about the tone. I cannot stress this enough. Fable is one of few games that makes me feel something to my core. I mean, it just seems kind of gay, doesn't it? And I'm not even sure what it is. Maybe a mixture of nostalgia, but just a sense of warmth and comfort when playing this game. 
We're going through Darkwood towards the Chapel of Scorm, or going through Barrowfields towards the Grey House, the environment and the atmosphere around you changes. It's that transition that gives the player a whole different feeling as they enter these areas. You're going to be asking yourself, why is this happening? Why is my screen changing colour? Where am I going? This, this can't be good. This is a distinctive detail that has a huge effect. It's such an effective tool, why isn't this in other games? and it looks very easy, it's very basic, it's just transitions. A player enters a section of the game, the game knows where the player is, then it changes. They've been doing that since like Halo 3. The purpose of creating these invisible trigger volumes is to let the computer know where the player is. The sad thing is as well, you don't see this again in any of the other Fable entries. I mean, the ones I played, not- Not that noticeable hold. I died! All right, all right. In regards to the music in this game, how the fuck can you sit there and tell me this does not sound like your childhood? This piece, for example, is called Summerfields. I can literally feel like I'm laying down on the grass outside on a hot summer's day, and all of that stems from imagination. It's really incredible when you think about it, to have that level of an effect to someone, even if someone as crazy as me. <laughs> Russell Shaw and Danny Elfman did a great job composing the soundtrack for this game. And let's have an honourable mention to the sequels as well. So we like about them, each to their own, but each one of those games also has a great soundtrack, which I actually listen to on the reg. Now being allowed access into Bowstone North thanks to Lady Grey's invitation, I go and chat to her and experience what it's like to talk to a woman for the first time in my life. I've always known that only someone who could conquer the arena could conquer me. She wants to marry, but first I need to get a few things. First things first, a gift, a black rose. My heart bleeds black blood for you, and it's like a lock that will never be unchained. Then I gotta get a house, and then finally an old necklace sh she used to have, and asked for me to speak around the town and see if anyone could help me locate it. Whilst going out to the NPCs in the area to find out where the necklace could be, they each tell you how Lady Grey killed her sister, and after speaking with numerous people and the conspiracy convict, you eventually find out her dead sister's necklace is an oak veil. This is when you can choose to marry Lady Grey and defeat Thunder in one-to-one -one combat, okay. or do what I did and speak with the grieving lover of Lady Grey's sister who tells me he used to flash his lantern three times at the stables by the Grey house. I go ahead and do exactly that and speak with a sister who tells me everything that happened, or the sister's ghost. She then proceeds to give me a letter explaining everything so I can now expose Lady Grey for what she did. Lady Grey appears out of nowhere and she'll marry you if you destroy the letter, which I do the opposite and she's not best pleased. Son of a bitch! Anyway, she then eventually leaves Bowerstone. The guy in the jail is then set free once you've spoken to the sheriff. A couple of things I do not like about this whole quest line. Firstly, if you marry her, or even if you don't marry her, you still become mayor of Bowerstone. Wouldn't you like to be mayor? Think of the power. It can all be yours. Just hand over the letter. We'll have to find a new mayor too. Uh, but I suppose you'll be interested in the job. You have proved your work after all. Secondly, this piece of paper, which could have been written by anyone, is the evidence against the Mayor of Bowerstone, who has so much power and respect. It is not enough evidence to justify mutiny. What I do like, however, is the backstory. She was once visited when she was a little girl by a masked man that encouraged her to kill her own sister. That masked man being, of course, Jack of Blades. I am not too sure how this falls into Fable 2's canon, where Lady Grey was supposedly killed for being a witch, but I guess either outcome from this game could still lead to that predicament. While I was going back and forth doing the Lady Grey questline, I ran into my sister, who tells me about who Jack of Blades really is, and turns out he is responsible for burning down the family home during the first act of the game, as well as killing the hero's father, kidnapping the mother, and mutilating Teresa. In order to get to Bargate Prison, which is where she's being held, we need to speak with the archaeologist again, as he knows of a secret passage that could take us there. However, he is still being hunted by Jack of Blades, so I go off and rescue him from these weird looking things. Gotta say, the design's very unusual, but I'm actually really fond of it. 
even though they're very annoying to fight. So I just choose Inferno. I've got your ring! I've got your ring! After saving the archaeologist, I'd still be safely in my cave if it wasn't for you. He tells me there's an ancient passage that leads to Bargate Prison through Lichfield Graveyard. I go to the graveyard and overhear a conversation about a sacred armour scattered around the graveyard by this mush. After speaking to Nostro, the gatekeeper, or the old gatekeeper, you then need to find all of his armour and weapons and bring them to his crypt. Then he allows you access to Bargate Prison. So, you helped the old one recover his armour. I'll let you through then. Be careful though, I don't want your finger marks all over me. <laughs> My turn. So I finally make it there and after so many years, finally, I reunite with my missing mother. I didn't even know I was still alive. She didn't even know I was still alive. Her whole family torn to pieces. Her whole life ripped apart. We have so much to catch up on. All those lost years. I'm ready to speak to you, mum. Get this damn cage open. We then get an Insta capture by Jack of Blades. That's right, folks. I do all of this. It's been seven hours and fifty. And the game just throws an insta capture. I know it's meant to build the tension and progress the story, but it could have been done better. For example, Jack could have just held her hostage or done a magic power that just, you know, absolutely mega blocked my fucking abilities or some bullshit reason like that. But just to get captured in a cutscene, it is really, really lazy. I mean, there are only a handful of these enemies here. I've been fighting twice as many before this point at a lower level as well. I just hate it when games do this. They instantly kill you or capture you in a cutscene and you can't do anything except sit there with a throbbing heart up. After a year of being locked up and getting the Natalie Portman treatment from Viva Vendetta, all the prisoners and myself are expected to perform an annual race around the prison, to which I mow far my way around with these, and my reward is a one-to-one -one meeting with the warden of the prison, who is reading you a passage. You have earned yourself a singular reward, one of my world-famous poetry readings. <laughs> What the fuck is this? No matter what book you open first, you never find the key on the first try. So you have to spend at least a whole year in Bargate Prison, minimum. The warden is pissed you're not interested in listening to his passage, so you're escorted to the torture chamber. Welcome to your temporary home. The torture chamber. We're gonna have some fun with you. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna enjoy this. Yeah, another year, another race, another book opening. After grabbing the key and a stick, I go grab my shit and rescue my mother again. And hopefully this time, don't get insta-captured by Jack. After shooting Poseidon's dick, we escape Bargate Prison. When we return to Albion, she tells you there is a key that gives you access to the sword Jack has been looking for all this time, in Hook Coast. And that we need to get it first, we being me of course, in order to get to Hook Coast, a portal in Darkwood needs to be activated. But before I get a chance to say anything, she gives me a power that increases my dick size from my to mini. Feels good, doesn't it? I don't know where my baby is, but I'll find so I make it to Darkwood and activate the portal by accumulating kills with the undead, to which takes me to a place called Hook Coast. And there is nothing I love more than snow in video games. I get to a section of the area and a magical barrier is blocking me from going any further. Then Mama G asked me to return to the guild. Nothing like being used as a fucking yo-yo, but we go-go. Yo, yo, yo. Ah! When I get close towards Maze's room where she is, she starts edging. What? She's then captured and tells me not to forget about the book. Legend has it that it was written by the Dark Ones. Necronomicon Ex Mortis. <laughs> Roughly translated, Book of the Dead. She's now been taken again for a third time by Jack of Blades. And so I return to Hook Coast so the Guildmaster can talk some shit through the Guild Seal so the barrier can come down. And to my surprise, it's Teresa being captured by Maze. Turns out Maze has been working for Jack of Blades all along because he's always felt no one could defeat Jack of Blades, therefore he went for the if you can't beat them, 
join the mentality. Anyways, Jack arrives and takes both our blood which he needs for the septimal key as part of the ritual. The reader then decides after letting Jack take the key and may steal some of our blood, which can now cause the fate of Albion in complete despair, to then release me and herself from Maze's captivity. I then fight Maze. The boss fight is pretty decent, a little clunky, especially when going into the lighthouse where the camera doesn't particularly know what to do with itself. I also committed a crime to get into the lighthouse, which seems a little bit baffling to me. Prior to this, I did actually upgrade the hell out of my character and the willpowers in this game, it's gotta be said, are sick. I went for the multi-arrow and absolutely tore Maze a new one. Anyway, once he's defeated, he then believes there is hope still for Albion and that I may be able to defeat Jack after all. You want to know why I did it, don't you? I suppose I'm just an old cop. Before we go ahead and finish the game, I just wanted to bring up that point I made at the start of the video about the skill progression in this game. But I am now almost at the point where all my skill and strength is maxed out, with a few remaining willpowers left to fully max out, which then makes my character the most powerful hero in all of Albion. Which I guess is sort of the point, but Jack has got nothing on my build right now. Which is where I can see the issue, the enemies will become fairly easy to fight and will feel like I've actually cheated the game. There is always a point in the game where I want to feel like a badass, powerful being and overcome my enemies. That's why we grind all the side content before we hit the the main story i mean that's how i do it but where is the line where does it become too easy for the player and start to feel like i've actually added cheats especially to get to this point right now i didn't actually grind as much as i usually would for the video i actually just followed the main story with only a handful of side quests there's still there's still actually quite a lot of side content left so most of the xp is from just main quests you could argue why don't you just increase the difficulty in the game but from what i can understand you can only do that on pc you can't do that on xbox so if i ever go to do another playthrough i'll probably do it on pc after chasing Jack across all the places you've been throughout the game, trying to catch up with him, fighting and running past his minions as he activates all the focus sites across all of Albion, I finally confront him in the final standoff at the Chamber of Fate at the Heroes Guild. He then proceeds to kill Scarlet Robe, which then triggers the most intense fight across the entire game. This is it. This is the antagonist. This is the main boss fight you've been waiting for. All these repressed years of anger and hatred building up slowly and eagerly. He killed your parents, mutilated your sister, imprisoned you, wreaked havoc across all of Albion. And now finally, after all these years, this is your time to get revenge. It's life or death. It is said he is one of the most, if not powerful, being in the void known to Matt, he's dead. Once he's defeated, you can either slay down Teresa with the Sword of Aeons and become more powerful than Jack and Rule Albion, which is the evil choice, or do what I did and chuck the Sword of Aeon in the Black Abyss. That is, or was, the original ending of the game, until there was a bit of an uproar because of such a build-up to end like. So the developers brought out a DLC called The Lost Chapters, which is included in the uh, 10 year anniversary edition as well, where you explore different parts of the map and eventually track Jack down again and kill him in his dragon form. Cut a long story short, in order to get to Jack of Blades, you need the soul of three heroes to open a gate. One soul is for a hero of the arena, aka Thunder. Now I'm not going to kill Thunder because I said I'm going through the good playthrough and I've already killed his sister. And so So after you defeat Jack in his dragon form, you then are given a choice to wear his mask or cast it back into the fire from whence it came. I feel like most of the boss fights in Fable follow the same formula because as the player, if you play like me, has been exploring the game and upgrading their leveling gear and becomes incredibly overpowered in such a short space of time, I feel the developers made sure during some boss fights, the boss can have a power that makes them invulnerable for a brief amount of time in order for the boss fight to last a little longer and for the boss not to be killed too quickly. For example, look at Tomb Blade. You can't do any damage to him until he has his blade stuck into the ground, for which he only does it every 30 seconds making the fight last longer. Maze and Hook Coast can use his shield power to stop taking damage and then teleports everywhere so the player can now only do damage briefly and also has to traverse around to find the boss in the boss fight. And now lastly Jack of Blades in both normal and dragon form. He can't take damage yet until a certain amount of enemies are down 
and as soon as you attack him, he's dead almost instantly. In his dragon form, he takes damage but then flies away. So again, you the player can't kill him too quickly, otherwise it's too easy. But we as the player realize at that point it's already too easy from the first damage we do against them. Then they flee, and then it's drawn out, and then we realize, oh, this is how they're gonna actually make it last longer. Give the enemy first of all more health. Make them stop fleeing or being invincible every 20 seconds, as it makes the fight itself repetitive and lacklustered. It's just the same rinse and repeat formula. And I know this is like originally a 2004 game, so it's not fair to compare this to today's standards. But I thought I'd mention it as it's something that I did actually notice. The DLC though is actually really fun and quite long. So Lionhead did a really good job on tying up loose ends and giving the player more adventure and experience with the Fable universe when they released it. In conclusion, I really do like Fable 1. It's a great game that I have revisited time and time again and would highly recommend it to anyone you haven't played it before or haven't in a while. Go grab yourself a copy and play it. It was quite fun reviewing one of my favourite games because I myself can see some of the things that aren't so good about it, but they do not tarnish or ruin the experience for me at all. I just thought I'd pinpoint more of the stuff I noticed now replaying as an adult and it may have come across quite harsh in some cases, but just to clarify, this is a great game and I feel some of Fable's negative points are more funny to me rather than make me not like the game and not play it. As in that case, that would be completely untrue. If you have never played an RPG before and have always wanted to try one, you will not find an easier way to start than Fable 1. It was also my first RPG and helped me slowly get into the gaming genre. I am very much looking forward to the new Fable when it comes out next year, and it'll be interesting to see how Playground and Third King's take on this franchise will take hold. The trailer looks amazing, and they've already kind of captured the look and feel of the beloved universe Lionhead Studios created for fans to enjoy, so we'll have to wait and see with anticipation. And that's all we have time for folks, so thank you all so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and leave a comment down below of what you thought on the video. This has been The Gamer Life. Until the next time, bye bye.